Yes, I'm going to give a cheerful talk about the world's most serious problems because I believe that we can see our way to thinking of them, of them as solvable and then solved. But first, a picture of a pelican. I live on the San Francisco Bay. I don't mean that as a metaphor. I live in a floating home in the San Francisco Bay. So pelicans will quite literally fly by the back door. And so on a recent evening, folks are over for dinner. I find myself with on one side of me one of those guys who believes that climate change is not real because it offends his deeply held political persuasions or something. And on, and on the other side, one of those other people who is paralyzed with fear with the imminence of climate change. Neither of those attitudes is actually very helpful. We have to get to a point where we actually understand that we can put our arms around these great challenges and get them solved. And so we're going to be taking a quick look at how we can think of these as business model challenges and think of getting them to the point where, although these problems are vast, they are solvable. Well, here's a list of these vast problems. And yes, the internet is on the list, along with water and power. Reversing climate change, not just ending it, reversing it. Food for 10 or maybe 11 billion people without destroying the planet. Unfilthying our oceans, trees. You could add to the list. There are almost certainly other things that belong on those. We do face vast problems at global scale. We do not have the ability to put in place a coordinated global solution. And yet, we're going to get these things done. Yeah, it's an old saying. It's attributed to Mark Twain, but it was actually his pal, Charles Warner. Everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. But take out the word weather and put in climate or oceans, and we now have the responsibility, actually the opportunity, the exciting challenge to take on these fantastic things. And we will. I do believe that we are going to solve them, but we're not going to solve them by just worrying about them. And I think of this in part because of an important lesson from history. You'll all know that I'm going to be talking about Robert Malthus, the Br British cleric who about 220 years ago did the math, actually he's British, so the maths, and he was able to <laughs> prove quite conclusively that we we're all going to starve to death. And the reason was that population grows exponentially, he actually says, geometrically, so by a certain percentage every decade or so, and that becomes this vast uprising curve, whereas food output from farms, he was able to show, using the data available at the time, was growing linearly, he said arithmetically, by a certain amount every decade. And sooner rather than later, that curve outstrips that curve, and this was the outcome that he foresaw. The power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to provide subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. A couple of things about this. First of all, it's really cheerful. <laughs> but also, it has this very passive view. This is going to happen kind of sorry. His idea for the solution was population control. But also you can see within this the view that Earth exists to support man. Also not a helpful way of thinking about this. So what did he get right? The exponential growth part, he kind of got right. At the time that Robert Malthus was alive, there were one billion people on Earth. Today it's 7.6 or so. And by the end of the century, maybe 10 or 11. So we can give him a passing grade on the exponential growth of population. But hunger, in fact, a lower percentage of the population is hungry today than at any time in human history. Certainly far lower than then. Of course, way too many people really are hungry. So what did he miss? Typically, the pe when you ask people that question, 
they come up with a shopping basket full of answers. Synthetic chemicals gave us fertilizers, they gave us herbicides and pesticides, we've had hybridized seeds and GMO organisms and tractors, refrigeration's really important. And on the business side, similarly things, but one worth paying attention to, crop futures. An invention from the Chicago Board of Trade in the 1870s, which meant that a farmer could be paid in October for a crop to be delivered the next August. That just didn't mean that the farmer and his or her family could eat and sleep during the long cold winter. It de-risked farming, and once farming was de-risked, banking got involved. And once banking was involved, agriculture became huge. The business thinking then really led the emergence of large-scale agriculture. That's a lesson we need to carry forward. But the shopping basket approach to thinking about what Malthus missed isn't enough. What did he really miss? He missed the power of human innovation. He missed ingenuity. And most of that innovation and ingenuity was not there thinking about the poor people in front of us who are about to be hungry. Almost all of it, and there are a couple of key exceptions, was there looking for growth and prosperity and bounty. And that, I'm going to argue, is the way we must think about climate change and all the rest of those things. We have the power as humanity to design for our descendants a better Earth. And that's the goal that we should be achieving. So the solutions start to look like, well, we've got these ingredients. Yes, human behavior. Yes, policies. But the business models for doing important new things with important new technologies. I'm not going to read these at all. But there is one, everybody knows that solar power has now emerged as the best way to power the Earth. The marginal cost for solar power may actually reach zero. It is already at a point where it is typically lower cost than fossil fuel, none of which would have been possible without the invention of a guy called Jigga Shah, who a decade or so created something really boring called the Power Purchase Agreement. It turns out a lot of people want solar power, not only because it's green, because once it's on your roof, you, have, you know the cost of power for the next 20 years. But neither businesses nor homes wanted to pay out the tens of thousands of dollars to do it. Jigga Shah realized that this was an opportunity for a banking innovation. That banking innovation meant people could put solar on their roofs or their company's roofs with no capital cost up front. That de-risked it, the banks got involved, and now solar has basically, it is taking over. And that's where we get to in thinking about the business models for building the better Earth that we want. A really big number, $100 trillion. The first context for thinking about the number $100 trillion is that this is the total economic output of the world. You take all of the gross domestic products of every country, put them in a pile, and it's $100 trillion. Another context for thinking about the number $100 trillion is this. It is the current estimate for the total cost to completely stop using fossil fuels. Now, that means we can't afford to do it in a year. The good news is we don't have either the technologies or the business, and we don't need to do it in a year. But if we were to try and do it in, let's say, 20 years, 25 years, four trillion a year. Now, four trillion a year is an interesting number, not just because it's smaller, because it's actually about the same amount of money that is spent every year subsidizing fossil fuels. So I'm going to repeat that. The amount that it will cost us to get rid of fossil fuels, we're already spending propping them up. We're, but the technologies and the business models to do that aren't yet mature. As they mature, the non-fossil fuel solutions become broadly affordable. As they become affordable, they become profitable. And as they become profitable, they become inevitable. And this is stuff that we can do 
in about 20 to 25 years. Elements of business models that we can put into the recipe include accounting, investing, trusting, and employing. Accounting, not everybody's most exciting subject. About 700 years ago, I think starting in Venice or somewhere, the double entry, the double column form of accounting came into being and now dominates corporations and governments. You have one column for credit and one for debit, and they have to balance. But over the last 10 years, accountants have realized it's not enough because we're pushing into unconsidered things, the externalities, as econ economists call them, a whole set of other things, including intellectual capital and what we're considering here, environmental and natural capital. And if you don't do this, this is what you get. Now, where I live in California, the free plastic bag is a thing of the past. You go to the supermarket, you get your groceries, paper bag, plastic bag, 25 cents. The consequence of that over the last two years is that the number of plastic bags being picked up on California's beaches has dropped by, depends on which county, it's measured by county, the least drop is 90%. And the, the most significant, one of the counties went from several thousand in the beach cleanup exercise to 42. And this, however, is a resort in Bali, Indonesia. And in Bali, Indonesia, and in Indonesia, plastic bags are not priced to include the price of picking them up. So putting the external cost, the full cost of things, into the cost of a product has real beneficial outcomes. As a result, we must look to a future, and we must all push for a future in which that full cost accounting happens. And we must get states and governments to do that likewise. Next, investing. I mentioned how Jigashar and before that, um, the crop futures enabled large-scale investing. Here's that number again, $100 trillion. McKinsey estimates that over $100 trillion, perhaps as much as 120, is looking to put places into long-term enduring infrastructures. So if we can actually create an infrastructure business that is about taking care of those externalities and cleaning up our earth, then this is the amount of money that's actually available. What they need is long-dated capital. These are sovereign funds, they're pension funds. They have no interest in a six-month gain on the stock market. They want to put money into a project and it's still there 20 or 50 years from now doing good work. It has to be an essential infrastructure. Yes, it has to provide good returns, but essential infrastructure is what those guys want to invest in. The money's there. The third thing is trust. When you think about the kinds of characters that we have available to spend these sums of money and to do these important things, and you put them up as a sort of list of species, they start to look like, oh, I don't know, the list of criminals at the police station. <laughs> right? We can't natively trust any of them. If only there were a technology that could enable us to actually build trust in, if only. And that's the promise of blockchain, which by taking the ledger, instead of having it secret and controlled by one person or one entity, spreading it out in multiple copies, starts to create the basis of unimpeachable ledgers of records that are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Smart contracts in which people get paid algorithmically upon executing, upon doing what they said they were going to do. Now, blockchain ain't perfect. It's sort of at the pimply teenager stage of life, but it seems to be headed in the right direction as putting the basis for executing trustworthy projects, de-risking projects, no matter where they are. And the last thing, employing. We're all used to the idea that another sad story we have is the jobless future. Of course, 
artificial intelligence and robots and software are eating all jobs. And the second problem, of course, is that jobs, good jobs, are being created in places like Boston and Northern California and Tel Aviv, which is not where most people are. Most people are actually going to be in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Believe that? I'm not sure. Consider the island of Borneo. And this, by the way, is a really sad story. I flew over Borneo about 20 years ago. It's the world's third largest islands. It was trackless jungle with elephants and rhinos and orangutans. And today it is, depending on whose count you believe, between 60 and 80% clear cut. So as a result, their forestry industry is dying and the touristry industry is dying and unemployment is rising. But trees and forests are really important for carbon sequestration. We've got the money to do that, and software doesn't plant trees. So one can actually think about global renewal projects as not only important, but actually having the potential to create hundreds of millions of jobs. Collectively, we have cut down and not replaced several hundred billion trees, and it's going to take a lot of work to replace them. And as we do that, we not only put real people to real work, but we actually create real value in local communities and real wealth. So full accounting, tens of trillions of dollars looking for good investment, blockchain for trust and employment, and of course, a pelican. I, no, I actually took this photograph myself two weeks ago. It's got a date stamp. Yeah, and I want you to use this one as a bit of a metaphor in a different way. In the background, those white little stripy things, those are the port of Oakland, the big container port in Northern California, and of course, the Pelican. And that's the image of the world that we need to design for our future, one in which there is a balance between the business of bounty and the strange beauty of nature. Because if we set that as our goal, we will achieve it. And the impossible problems will become possible. Thank you.